Now as he is coming to Jericho, there is a man by the wayside who is blind. Hearing the crowd, the movement of the people, he inquires as to what's going on. And someone said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And those that were standing around him told him to shut up. He was disturbing the peace. But he cried all the louder. And Jesus commanded that the man be brought to him. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. And the man followed Jesus. Now Jesus is coming into the city of Jericho. He's passing through Jericho. And Jesus entered, verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. There are actually three sites of the city of Jericho. There is the ancient site that goes back to Joshua's day. There is the Tell Jericho to the present day. It is right next to Elisha's Springs. And that is no doubt why they built the city there in the beginning. It is one of the oldest cities in the world. And today, of course, it is just nothing but excavated ruins. There is, well, there should be four Jerichos because there is the present-day Jericho today, which is just east of this ancient site of the city of Jericho that was destroyed by Joshua. And it is an Arab village, an active village, and... Um, Quite a popular place even at the present time. Towards Jerusalem, about a mile and a half to two miles south and towards Jerusalem two or three miles, there was another site of Jericho. And then going on even a little further towards Jerusalem, you come to the site of Jericho that we have in our text, the site of Jericho that existed during the time of Christ. This city of Jericho was built by Herod the Great. And just recently have they begun the excavations of this city and they've already uncovered the amphitheater, much like the amphitheater in Caesarea and Beth Shin, typical Roman amphitheater. And they are uncovering quite a few interesting buildings that date back to the time of Christ, the time of Herod the Great, who built this particular city of Jericho that is in our story tonight. But Jesus is entering in and passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. And it should be noted that it isn't really necessary to pass through Jericho in going to Jerusalem. But Jesus, I am certain, passed through Jericho in order that he might meet the second man. The first man was blind, had faith to be healed. The second man is introduced to us here as a man named Zacchaeus. And we are told that he was the chief among the publicans. Now the publican was a tax collector. And they were considered by the Jews as turncoats, quislings. They were collaborators with Rome. 
and thus they were hated by the Jews because they were collecting the taxes for Rome and the Jews had a great aversion to paying taxes to Rome. In fact, you remember one day they tried to trap Jesus, asking him if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And they figured, we've got him trapped. If he says, yes, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, the whole crowd will turn against him because they hate those taxes so vehemently. So we can turn the people against Jesus because if he says, no, it isn't lawful, then we'll run down and report him to the Roman officials. He's, uh, you know, an insurrectionist and he's uh, going against Rome. He's advocating uh, not paying taxes. He could be arrested for that. So they figured, man, we really got him trapped. You know, this is a catch-22. He can't answer either way without being in trouble. And so Jesus said, give me a coin. And someone gave him a coin, and he held it up, and he said, whose image is on this coin? It was a Roman coin, and so they responded, it's the image of Caesar. And he flipped the coin back to him and said, okay. Give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and give to God the things that belong to God. But they thought they had him trapped because if he said, yes, you should pay taxes, boy, would the Jews all turn against him at that point. But he evaded their trick question. Now, he was, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. The city of Jericho was on the main route from Jerusalem to the east. It sort of controlled the crossing of the Jordan River. And so all of the goods that were brought from the east to be sold in Jerusalem, their first taxing took place right there at Jericho. Jericho was a very wealthy city. It was inhabited chiefly by publicans and Pharisees who were arch enemies. And Jesus is passing through Jericho and this man who was one of the chief tax collectors, also it says he was rich, which probably tells us that he was crooked because, and what's new, uh, The Roman government would levy a district with a certain tax that was to be given. And it was the duty of the tax collector to pay that levy to Rome. Anything above that was his to keep. And Rome would ask no questions. So the tax collectors became extortioners. In fact, you remember when John the Baptist was ministering, some of the tax collectors came to him and said, what shall we do? And John said, don't extort any more than what you are required to collect. Don't go to extortion. And they were noted for being extortioners because the incentive was there, man. It belongs to you. Anything you can collect, above the levy that Rome has uh, placed upon a territory is yours to keep. And so the fact that he was rich no doubt indicated that he was an extortioner. He had, was shrewd at gathering more than what was required. And he sought to see Jesus who he was. Now, he didn't know who was at the center of the crowd. All he knew is that there was a crowd of excited people. He was curious to see this crowd of excited people, but he had a problem. He was short. 
he had two problems. He dare not get into the crowd. He was hated. If he would venture into that mob, he would come out with a real beating. I mean, he'd come out with bruised ribs, and uh, they, they would really work him over, get him in a crowd like that, and, and they would just really work him over. So he, he was curious, this crowd of people moving along, and who in the world is in the center of the crowd? And so, seeing the direction that the crowd was moving, he ran ahead. Climbed up into a tree and waited for the crowd to pass by so that he could see who was in the center of the crowd. Notice, he wasn't really seeking Jesus or seeking to see Jesus. He was just wondering who it was. He sought to see Jesus who he was. In other words, he, he maybe heard the name, but he didn't know who he was, and he wanted to see this man that everyone was so excited about and, and crowding around. Of course, this was after the healing of the blind man, and so there was probably a lot of excitement in the crowd. Really an animated group of people, and multitudes coming because no doubt the word got around that Bartimaeus was healed, the guy of the beggar, everybody knew. He was seeing. And so this lively, animated crowd moving up the streets, passing through Jericho, this tax collector's curiosity got the best of him. He wanted to see who it was. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And he said unto him, Zacchaeus, hurry and get down, for today... I'm going to stay at your house. <laughs> it's interesting to me that Jesus knew that Zacchaeus had faith to be saved. And I believe that this is the reason why Jesus came to Jericho. I think he knew all along that Zacchaeus was there and Zacchaeus had faith to be saved. He knew that the blind man had faith to be healed. When the blind man was calling out to him, Jesus stopped and he said, bring him to me. And when he said, what do you want? The blind man said that I might receive my sight. Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. He knew that he had the faith to be healed. I believe he also knew that Zacchaeus had the faith to be saved. And so Jesus pauses on his way to Jerusalem in order to bring salvation unto this man who was so hungry and desperate. And so Zacchaeus came down with haste and he received him joyfully. And so we can see now this interesting scene. Jesus leaves the crowd and goes into the house of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is all excited, filled with joy. But the Pharisees, on the other hand, when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, he was gone to be the guest of a man that is a sinner. And so the mixed emotions with Zacchaeus, great joy. Come on in, Lord. And, you know, the, the hosting of Jesus, but with the Pharisees, the murmuring, the finding fault. He's gone to be the guest of a man that we know as a sinner. The next scene and what transpired, what Jesus said, we are not told. I wish we knew. I wish that more could have been written. I wish that they would have recorded the conversation of Jesus with Zacchaeus. What went on behind the closed doors, we don't know. All we know that when the doors are opened again, Zacchaeus is a changed man. 
And he stands there and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. You can take that two ways. Anytime you can get a Jew to say, I'll give away half of what I've got and restore fourfold of anything I've taken illegally, you know that salvation has come to his house. <laughs> For he is a Jew. <laughs> he is the son of Abraham. But what Jesus no doubt meant was, he is a son of Abraham by faith. Abraham by faith was accounted righteous, but it was a faith that produced a work. It was an active faith. It was a faith that was demonstrated by his works. Now this man is speaking of his intentions. I'm going to give half of my riches to the poor. And I'm going to restore to every man four times the amount that I extorted above the regulation. The works show the faith. And Jesus said, This day is salvation come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, who is the father of those who believe. And he expressed his faith by the works that he indicated. And then Jesus said these words, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now notice this is sort of a response to the Pharisees that are out there murmuring, saying, this man has gone to be the guest of the sinner. And in response to that accusation, Jesus pretty much says, hey, that's the purpose of my coming. That's why I'm here. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. What does it mean to be lost? It means to be living without hope in this world or in the world to come. Living a life that is alienated from God, apart from God. When are you lost? Well, you're lost right now. You're a loss to your family. If you're not a child of God, your family is suffering as a result of it. You're not being the kind of a leader that God would have you to be within the home. You're not exercising that godly influence that you should be exercising over your children. Your children are at a loss because of you. You're a loss to the community. But worse than that, you'll be lost when you stand before God. The book of Revelation tells us that the great white throne of God is there in heaven and all of the dead, small and great, will arise to stand before that great white throne. And they will be judged according to the things that are written in the books. And whosoever's name is not found written in the book of life will be cast into Gehenna, the second death. And it doesn't take much of an imagination beyond just what the scripture tells us to visualize what it would mean to be lost when you stand before God. When the gavel comes down and the verdict, the final verdict is given concerning your life, and you hear those words, lost. As Jesus said, there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth.
How is a person lost? Some time ago, a fellow made a tract, two-sided tract. On the face of it, it says, what must I do to be saved? And it had the scripture, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Turning the card over, it says, what must I do to be lost? And in big, bold letters, it said, nothing. Just continue as you are. Living as you are. And you may be living a very good and a very moral life. But if you do not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be lost. If you do not make a movement towards him and accepting of Christ... You're lost. And it doesn't really matter how moral or good or honest or upright you may be or what your neighbors or the community thinks of you. You may be voted the outstanding citizen of the year. You may have your picture on the society pages of the newspaper every other week. But if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're lost. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. The interesting thing, he's on his way to Jerusalem even now when this scene is taking place. This is his last stop before he gets onto Bethany and into Jerusalem. Our very next scene uh, is the triumphant entry. Jesus will give a parable, but then the very next scene is the triumphant entry. He's coming to Jerusalem to provide salvation. How? By taking upon himself the sin, the guilt of every man, and dying for man. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, the interesting thing is that with Zacchaeus, Jesus sought him. When Zacchaeus ran ahead, climbed a tree, Jesus, rather than turning the corner and going up the street, came right up to the tree, looked up on those branches where old Zacchaeus was hanging on, and he called him by name and said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and get down. I want to stay at your house today. He was seeking him. He was seeking him that he might save him. And Jesus Christ is still seeking the lost. His whole purpose in coming, the whole purpose of becoming a man and dwelling among us was that he might seek and save that which is lost. And as you look at the cross and the death of Jesus Christ, you begin to realize how awful a thing it is to be lost. Because you realize the price that he was willing to pay in order to redeem you. And if being lost wasn't a big deal, he never would have gone to the cross. You see, when we're talking about being lost, we're talking about eternity. We're talking about the eternal 
future being lost from God, from the family of God, from the love of God. And Jesus came and Jesus died in order that that would not be your fate. However, you're not just saved by being an American or living in the United States or even attending the church. You are saved by a living, active faith in Jesus Christ that will demonstrate itself in the works in your life. You're not being saved by just saying, well, I believe in God. Or even I believe in Jesus. For a lot of people believe in Jesus as a historical character. Sure, he must have lived in it. There are some idiots who try and deny that he ever lived. But that's, you know, you don't even have to answer that kind of stupidity. But it's more than just believing that Jesus lived upon the earth at one time. It's believing that Jesus took your sin and died in your place and committing your life to his lordship, surrendering your life to him. That's the whole purpose for his coming. I came, he said, to seek and to save that which was lost. They found fault with him. They were murmuring. They were complaining because he had gone into the house of a sinner. But Jesus said, hey, don't you know that's what my business is all about? Don't you know that's why I came? That's the purpose for my coming. And you know, it means that every man is in one of two categories. You're either saved or you are lost. And tonight, as we sit here in church, there are some that are sitting here that are lost. They know not our Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And it's really sort of awesome and tragic to look around and realize that some of the people that we are seeing are lost. And if they don't do something about it, it's very likely that they will be lost eternally. And we may see these same individuals standing one day before God when the books are open and hear that awesome, hopeless cry, lost. But you don't need to be. That's the whole thing. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why he came. It is always rather profound to think that the coming of Jesus Christ into this world, that the plan of God in redeeming man, that the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross was totally in vain for some people because they've never reacted to it. And thus for them his coming was in vain. Thus for them, his seeking is in vain. Thus to them, his ability to save is in vain because they've never availed themselves the salvation that a man can know through Jesus Christ. But it's up to you. It's your choice. He provided. He did all that he could do. And now it's up to you.
Maybe he drew you tonight by curiosity, even as Zacchaeus was drawn. You hear, man, there's a big crowd down there. I wonder what the crowd is all about. You sort of slipped in to see what was going on. He drew you. He exposed you to his love and to his work. And now it's up to you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that Jesus came, that he sought us, and that he bought us with his blood. He paid the price of our redemption. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ for time and eternity. Lord, for those that are here tonight that cannot make that kind of a claim, those who have not yet had that personal encounter with you, I pray, Lord, that before this evening is over, they might settle their relationship with you and that they might settle their eternal destiny in Jesus' name.